My deep appreciation of theater history was instilled in me by Tom Empey, a college mentor to me and hundreds of others. While teaching Greek theater terms, he would grab the fabric of his slacks and say, You see these pants? Euripides, Eumenides making light of content that could be considered rather dry and stuffy while still maintaining respect for the art, which is what I want to do with this podcast. For each episode, I invite a guest from the many paths my theater career has taken me down. I give my guest no idea what we'll be talking about, but they know we're going to find an outrageous story about theater history and perhaps get a better understanding about why we're still doing it after all these years. So welcome to Euripides Humanities, and I am your host, Aaron Odom. Hello, my friends and listeners. This is Aaron Odom from Trident Theater in Sheridan, Wyoming, with another episode of Euripides Humanities, a theater history podcast. Here we are, episode 13. And I don't care what you think about unlucky numbers. That's where we are. I'm not skipping it. I'm not a hotel. <laughs> I just want to say, if this is your first time listening, or if you have been a loyal subscriber from the beginning, I so, so appreciate you. It's so great to have more Tridentinos out there in the world. If you like us, go ahead and make sure you're following us, follow us on your social media, follow our hashtags, but more than anything, tell your friends. Let them know we've got this cool thing going on, because as I've said in the last couple episodes, I'm not apologizing. This is way too much fun. I'm having a blast doing this. My guests are having a blast doing this. And to prove that point, I have Euripides Humanities' first returning guest today. Those of you who may have heard our very first episode, the pilot episode, The Consequences of the Interregnum, you know my guest who has the drag persona that you can find online, Mrs. Diana Carfire. Ladies and gentlemen, friends and listeners, this is my good friend coming back to the program, James Stress. Hello, James. What's up, Mr. Aaron? Woo! Good to have you back, man. Here we are, damn near six months later. Here we are. Know, this is... And I'm lucky number one and lucky number 13. I'm lucky. Hey, there you go. Lucky, <laughs> lucky, lucky, lucky. So since we last talked, James, some big things have happened to you in your life. You have had a really cool thing happen. You've been studying for your cosmetology license. And yes. And you passed your boards. Congratulations. I passed, I passed my boards in three days. Oh, damn, damn. It was I quick. Understand. I understand that it's like an intense little uh, situation there when you're actually Yeah. There. A lot of people think like being a hairstylist is easy peasy, but it's mostly anatomy and physiology. So <laughs> yeah, nine straight hours of like having to know oh. things like that was intense. Mm -hmm. And like understanding skull shapes and skull oh my God. textures and, structure and all that. structure and diseases and uh, funguses and... Yeah, all kinds of crazy Ugh. things. It was awesome. What to do so, if you cut part of your finger off? Like, <laughs> is there bedside manner they teach in that? It's like, I'll be right back. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, as long as there's no blood on them, you're like, I'll be right back, ma'am, and go to the back, and you're like, I need the super glue. Hurry, hurry! <laughs> I filleted my finger, Carlos. <laughs> like. <laughs> Congratulations on that. They can find Thank you. you. So any of our listeners who want to find mm -hmm. you and schedule an appointment, you are at, uh, I believe, a couple places, but the Hair Bar, is that right? I'm at the Hair Bar downtown. You can find the Hair Bar online by searching mm -hmm. us. And then we're at 314 West Elm, and you can schedule an appointment directly through me by texting 307-247-2333. Uh, and I'm and a my, color and spe cut specialist. So, and my friends it out. and listeners, my friends and listeners, I have to let you know the hair bar is an establishment where you can have a cocktail while you get your hair cut. This is correct. An adult juice box. <laughs> 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 That's the best. I love it. Now, another thing happened since we last had you on. Uh, we yeah. just passed June 2021, which was, uh, you know, uh, our annual Pride Month. And 
happy Pride Month to the LGBTQA plus community out there who's listening. Awesome. Um, and I forgot I, I'll say I, but you have your uh, drag persona still that you will perform in, but you got right. a couple opportunities through Pride. And, and from what I saw in Casper, Wyoming, there was a really excited Pride community yeah. there. Tell me about that a little bit. Okay, so I've I've been going to Pride since 1999, I think. And my mm-hmm. first Pride was in Los Angeles. I've done Vegas Pride, Phoenix Pride, uh, Denver Pride, Casper Pride, and uh, New York Pride. And it was so crazy. This Pride was really cool because the turnout was massive. It, it, like everybody showed up. All of the performance venue uh, shows sold out. Any ticketed oh, wow. event sold out completely. So the drag shows that were at night and the drag brunch in the morning sold out within like hours of being on Eventbrite. So it was oh. amazing. But the cool thing about it is I did, uh, <laughs> I performed on the main stage uh, <gasps> with our, our good friend, Aaron Wood produced it. So shout out. Oh to yeah. Aaron. Okay. The drag queen that came from Denver, uh, Ms. Kylie Michaels, she was like, <laughs> you know, audience mingling and stuff after uh, myself and another uh, performer opened the show for them. And she was asking the audience what their sexual preferences were. And she's like, okay, all my lesbians in the audience. And there were like five girls that were like, Wah! and everyone was like, yeah. And I mean, it was like shoulder to shoulder <laughs> packed in there, right? And then she's like, I want to know where all the gay men in the audience are. And you literally heard like, woo! <laughs> like, like seven men like, trying their hardest to like drown out. <laughs> and everyone's like dying, like hooting and hollering after it. And she goes, okay, I just, I just want to make sure we are at a pride event, right? This is a dr- drag show. Is everyone here for the drag show? And everyone loses their minds. <laughs> and she goes, okay, now by round of applause, how many heterosexuals are in the audience? And it was like a fucking oh. Garth Brooks concert. <laughs> 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 yeah, to say oh, at least. good. You and I lived through um, quite a uh, perilous event in our college career. Yeah, um, yep. uh, on our opening night, if I recall correctly, of a Pretty, show yeah. again, Yankees. Pretty right? close. Yeah. So yeah. you and I, you and I experienced Matthew Shepard. Uh, I was I was friends with him. That was so crazy because that time is so far removed yeah. from what it is now here. And I just think it's amazing that there was such a turnout because really, at the yeah. end of the day, at the end of the day, what's wrong with going to a drag show? It's Nothing. just. It's ridiculous. Oh, look at her. <laughs> Over James's shoulder, he has a great poster of who is that? This is Jinx Monsoon. Oh, damn it. There it is. Yep. There it is. Yep. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> and and you know what? I mean, it's 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 to that point where we are voting for these people now in like fantasy online groups, just like we're voting mm-hmm. for fantasy football or fantasy baseball. I, I mean, it's it's here. <laughs> They're queer. It's here. Get used to it. You can win a hundred thousand dollars now. Oh, there's that. Okay. I think that's amazing. And thank you for, you know, supporting that and performing in that. And just, and just again, being, uh, being okay to have that as part of what you do in the performing arts and let people just go, Oh wait, this can be part of the norm. Exactly. That's awesome. That's awesome. Thank you. Speaking of the norm (laughs) or not the norm, I suppose it's probably probably time to get into the episode now. (laughs) I've wanted to do spooky on stages for a while now. And when it came to my mind, I'm like, gosh, people really like James and I as, as a host and guest on the show. They really thought we had some great chemistry. <laughs> oh, um, I'm, I'm coming up to episode 13. I'm like, ooh, there's some stigma there. James, you also have a particular, I guess it's a, a part of your character. Tell me your birthday again. I am born on the opposite. I am October 31st. I'm a <laughs> Halloween baby. Oh, a Halloween baby. Someone born on Hall Hallows Eve on the 13th yes. episode. On the 13th episode. <laughs> well, I guess now I'll it makes start. Sense. <laughs> I guess I'll start with this. James, have you ever had a ghost experience in the theater? Ooh. And if this is bringing up PTSD, we can stop now. <laughs> I'm like, I'm gonna get my Xanax. No, um, yeah, okay. I've had a few ghost experiences, period. 
Mm. But we we did have a theater ghost um, mm. at my theater at UNLV. Oh no, kidding! I don't. Yeah, I don't remember its name, but they frequented the middle section because ours is proscenium staging, so it just was a fan style seating arrangement. Right. Okay. Okay. Uh, raked style. They frequently did weird things in the very center row. Ooh. Chair seats would like spring down mid performance, like when we were like <laughs> rehearsing, and the theater would be dark, and we'd hear like kadunk dunk, and we'd like look out, and there'd be like three chair seats down, just that down. were supposed down. to be sprung right. back up. Lights right. would flicker sometimes when you were walking down the stairways mm-hmm. on the side. Uh huh. The mm-hmm. sinks would like creak, toilets would flush. So yeah, Ooh. it was it was cool, but like. I had a very supernatural experience with our uh, friend Robert Hamilton, but we mm. weren't at the theater. We were done with rehearsal and driving to my house, mm-hmm. and we stopped at a at a truck stop to get <laughs> snacks because we were going to watch a movie when we got there. And we parked in the dark, and when we turned off the lights of the car, this like blue, see through something went Ooh. right in front of the windshield. And both of us saw it, and it it did that. I looked at him, and he goes, "Do you see that?" And I was like, "Yeah, definitely see it." And it just went, and like took off into the distance like a blue streak at like hundreds of miles an hour and vanished. And I literally looked at him again, and I was like, "Did you see that?" And he goes, "Blue." (laughs) See through, vanished. I said, "Okay, good. I'm not having an hallucination." He said, "Not unless we both just smoked the same thing that was bad." Was like, nope. <laughs> Definitely, this is not that strong. <laughs> I do appreciate you getting me this drink before we got in the car, though. <laughs> wonderful! Whoa. Wow! Wow! Yeah. So that's my yeah. biggest like experience. What about you? I see. Did my, you ever have um, any? My in my high school theater at home. I uh, when I came back from Seattle, I taught there in the after school program for a few years, and it was the the theater was named after my high school theater teacher who passed away in two thousand. She was a very sweet lady, loved theater. Well, okay, I'm gonna go back. She could be a sweet lady. Most of the time, she was <laughs> really uh, gruff ogreish woman who was uh, and and she'll she would be the first to say it not an attractive person and would yell at you quite often on stage when things weren't going right uh, but we loved Henry Henry cared about all of us and she wanted the show to be damn good and that's why she was so cranky with all of us so after she died I knew like the first couple times I was uh, doing a big show in that theater I, I I I'm not necessarily a spiritual person but I go out in the house and I'm like Henry if you're here <laughs> Just bless this show. These kids are good kids. Please make it work. And that show was amazing. Just amazing. And afterwards I went, well, that seemed to work. So she must be here. So it was about three or four years into my teaching in that program that I would tell the students this when the the program's getting bigger and bigger every fall. I have about 40 students in the house in our first initial meeting. And I'm like, so this is the show that we're going to do. But I'll, I'll be honest with you. Like, if you're here just to learn a little bit about this, but you don't really want to go into it, that's fine. Please respect the people who are here to do this full time. Because there is somebody who devoted her life to this space. And she is probably still here with us. And I gave the same kind of intro I just gave to you. I'm like, she was a mean old bat. She uh, was cranky all the time and she would yell at you and everything. And it's all because she wanted everything to go right. And the kids all went, yeah, sure. And I'm not even kidding you, James. As soon as they said, yeah, sure. A light went out right next to me on the stage. And I didn't, I didn't even hesitate. I went, see, see, there she is. Don't doubt it. So if you piss Henry off, that's on you, okay? <laughs> but no, no, that was, that was my only one. But That's amazing, so, though. Yep. So here, we're going to talk about one that is kind of well-known, but not really. This is a, it's just a, f- a fascinating story. I just came upon this in my studies one day. Oh, I can't wait. Here we go. On a regular November evening in 1955, Jack Hayden was working the Covent Garden Underground Station in London. The Covent Garden Station is smack dab in the middle of the West End Theatre District in London. Have you ever been to West End? 
No, it's on my bucket list. I haven't I, been to London. I know, yet. me too. And it was so fun researching this, like finding all the places and going on Google Maps and getting street views. And you're like, oh my God, this is like a, a, a Broadway in a different multiverse. <laughs> right. <laughs> but old. Right. The old now, Broadway. The Covent Garden station had just closed for the evening and Hayden was finishing up his closing duties. While busy with his tasks, Hayden saw a man standing still and silent several yards away from him on the platform. Hayden called to the man that uh, the station was closed and locked up for the night and that he'd let him out in a moment. Hayden then finished whatever task he was working on and then uh, grabbed his keys and looked up to the man to help him escort him, escort him out. The man was gone. Hayden walked over to where the man stood. Not a trace could be found. Hayden later commented that the man looked very distinguished and that the man wore, quote, an old fashioned gray suit with a funny looking old style collar and light colored gloves, end quote. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I mean, we had, a, we had a very distinct description there. So <laughs> right. we obviously saw something standing. <laughs> <laughs> what did he look like? I don't know, just a guy. <laughs> Four days later, at about the same time in the evening, he saw the man again. Hayden was at a further distance this time, but recognized the man because he was wearing the same clothes as the last time he'd seen him and standing in the exact same spot. Okay. Hayden called to the man and began to approach him. Now, all the lights are on and everything, and he can see this man clearly. But as he came closer to the man, the man vanished into thin air. <laughs> I've been taking the J train. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Later that same week, Hayden was working at the same station with a colleague. Her name was Rose Ring when they heard a scream come from the staff room. Okay. Another colleague, a young man named Victor Locker, had just seen the man when entering the staff room, the same one that Hayden had seen. And as soon as the man mm -hmm. and Locker saw each other, the man vanished again, causing Locker to cry out. The man never spoke, but was seen several more times with no regular pattern of appearance. It's so weird. <laughs> right? And, and he's not malicious. He's just like, hi, I'm here. And then they're like, hey, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah. Now, the West End has no shortage of ghost stories. In some cases, it's almost just general knowledge that certain places are haunted. For example, Drury Lane is apparently the most haunted theater in London. But this is not a story about Drury Lane. I'm sure we'll discuss that nexus of the paranormal in a future episode. No, no, this is another story entirely. So back to Hayden and Locker. At some point, someone had shown them a photograph from nearly 100 years prior. Both Hayden and Locker were shocked. This was the man they had seen in the Covent Garden tube station several times. The okay. silent and distinguished man who would disappear when seen. Apparently, Locker was so disturbed by the incidents that he was granted transfer to another station. <laughs> they didn't even question it. They're like, dude, this dude is really... <laughs> Charlie needs to go. <laughs> He's scaring the customers. Don't go in there! There's a ghost! <laughs> All right, get out of here. <laughs> the photograph was a portrait of William Terrace. Terra spelled T-E-R-R-I-S-S. -S. Terrace. Yeah. yeah. Okay. One of the most popular stage actors in London at the end of the 19th century. One source I found called him the Chris Hemsworth of his day because he's a, fairly yeah. he's a fairly handsome actor, but also played a lot of tough guy hero types, or at least what passed as those in that day. And like today's Thor... Terrace had widespread fame due to his vast talent at an, as an actor and the length of his resume. He was known everywhere in the entire British Empire. By the length of yeah. his resume. By the length. <laughs> it's the entire British Empire. <laughs> That's a lot of ports, if you know what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> now, William Terrace was born William Lewin, L-E-W-I-N, in London on February 20th, 1847. His father was a barrister, a lawyer, and William attended grammar school at Bruce Castle School. While he did not necessarily excel academically, William impressed teachers and peers with his athletic abilities. 
Jay Commons Carr, who grew up to be a playwright and drama critic, attended school with William when they were boys. Later in life, Carr noted about William in his work titled, and I'm just going to stop here for a moment because I love when people just couldn't come up with a simple title. Here it is. Here's the whole thing. Oh, God, take a breath. Some eminent Victorians. That could be it, but no, there's a colon and a subtitle. <laughs> Personal recollections in the world of art and letters. Wow. Blah. Okay, quote. If he gained but little learning in school, he at any rate acquired a perfect mastery in the art of tree climbing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Learned it well. Master <laughs> took all the notes. <laughs> so basically, this was something of a dig on him being rather athletic and probably yes. not the best of students. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> now, using his athletic aptitude to his advantage, William enlisted in the Merchant Navy, but never really flourished there despite his penchant for the outdoors and the adventurous lifestyle. William had several other odd jobs upon returning to London and it looked like they were mostly arranged by members of his family, but nothing really stuck. But in his spare time, William enjoyed attending the theater and soon found himself auditioning for a play. Fantastic. Yes. Well, it didn't take too long for him to get cast, as he was actually quite likable and not unpleasant to look at, and was reported to have a very soothing voice. I mean, if this isn't Chris Hemsworth already, like, I mean, he doesn't right? look like he doesn't look like him, but, <laughs> but you know, like, okay, but in the dark, I'm just going to imagine, yeah, in the dark. <laughs> So he first took to the stage in Birmingham in 1868 in the role of Chowser in a play called The Flying Scud. Oh. <laughs> that just has such a pleasing sound as it rolls off the tongue. The Flying Scud. It's flying Scud. While not much is known about the play, this is great. It is well known for the line of dialogue in which a character excuses himself from an awkward situation, which is part of the vernacular today. Oh. Excuse me, sir, but I have to see a man about a dog. <laughs> Dead. <laughs> Nothing else is known about this play except for that line. They're like, oh, that was good. Let's write that down. Fabulous. From what has been researched, this is the first time this phrase had been used. But remember, this was the heyday of big melodramas in London. Certainly some of the more experimental types of theaters were seen, but for big money drama, you go with melodramas. It's where you saw the big names, you got a grand experience, much the same as going to a big Broadway show today. So let me explain a little about melodramas. They come from a time when a more urbanized society was less and less well, literate. <laughs> so, yes. So, plays were written to appeal to emotions rather than to appeal to intellect. <laughs> <laughs> That's the nicest way of saying, like, well, they couldn't understand it when we were talking about the movement of the stars. <laughs> I need to see moving pictures <laughs> in life. Real life. <laughs> You're going to have to explain that again. My ever-loving soul does what now? Huh? <laughs> okay. Where's a pretty girl that gets run over by a train? All right. I got a knife. I cut the rope. Right. <laughs> right. 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 Therefore, the costuming and staging was outlandishly elaborate, but more so, the acting was broad and appealed to the emotional complications of the play. <laughs> oh, fabulous. <laughs> Overacting, not a thing. You have received a letter, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Are you okay? Do you need a lozenge? I am fine. Yeah, I was... shall open this envelope now. <laughs> now. <laughs> Thou shalt witness. Okay. In fact, the plays 
were basically structured to have stock characters which could easily be recognized, not only by actions and voice, but each was basically assigned a musical instrument that would play along with each actor oh. on stage. <laughs> Great. So like the hero would have a trumpet as his musical accompaniment and the villain would probably... And the villain would have like a cello, <laughs> and yes. you know, the, the, you'd have the uh, ingenue come on, and she'd play with a flute. <laughs> the comic relief had like the bad French horn player, yeah, or a trombone, <laughs> and like cymbals <laughs> crashing and everything. Yes. So William, what with his good looks, his pleasant voice, and affability, often found himself playing the sensitive and courageous hero who would battle the dastardly deeds of a foul villain. <laughs> and remember, in melodramas, we're not talking about complexity here. <laughs> no. The plays almost always ended happily with the villain being punished for his evil deeds and the hero being rewarded, oftentimes with the hand of the persecuted heroine. And along the way, they got into terrific peril, incredible sword fights, uh, and probably had to dodge a runaway carriage or two. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it just, yeah, like the piano's falling. Again. Mm -hmm. Again. <laughs> Step to the right. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, this is the best part. It's when the safe comes down. All right. <laughs> But like I said, that's just the plot. This blew my mind. Like the lengths that they went to just to please people who were going to stage. This is amazing. Terrific technical achievements were often seen in melodramas. Okay. Battle reenactments, both naval and on land were not unusual to see on the melodramatic stage. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> Cast a hundred people, put swords in their hands. Maybe we'll teach them how to use them but you got to see it. <laughs> Live. Now, check this out. One amazing achievement is the construction of treadmills that could be raised from beneath the stage that horses and chariots could run on so they could run at full speed and never move an inch. Wow, okay, so, <laughs> wow. Uh, right? Man. They brought in actual scientists and engineers to come up with this stuff. And like A why? treadmill that would hold a horse. Right, that would hold a horse Jeez. and a chariot. Way and the, and the, guy could, the guy could whip it and the horse would go faster and it would just, it was, yeah. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to be the maintenance man. Oh. <laughs> man. Did the horse poop on it again? Damn it. <laughs> no, Carl, we lost to Clydesdale tonight. Went right through the damn thing. Gotta rebuild it by tomorrow. <laughs> I'll get right on it. Uh, <laughs> Someone's got a trained prancer. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was like watching a live film that never left the square of the proscenium. Oh, oh my God. That'd be really kind of cool. Now, into this world, William fit right in. Okay. In fact, soon after his premiere in Birmingham, William took his stage name, William Terrace, as he thought it sounded more suiting to his onstage persona, much more than William Lewin. Lewin. <laughs> it's the great, handsome, strong actor, William Lewin. Lewin. <laughs> no, Terrace. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Within two years, he had made his way to the West End, appearing in a small role at the old Prince of Wales' Theater in 1870, which has since been demolished, and I think office buildings are there now. William didn't seem too entirely pleased with how difficult it was to find immediate stardom. <laughs> <laughs> Story of my life. <laughs> Inside actor joke. But I'm gorgeous and handsome and beautiful and... You're not casting me? Why well, not? You can have this spear and stand over there. and Maybe there will be something next month. But for yeah. right now, you're a little green. <laughs> <laughs> now, he had married in 1870. He married fellow actor Isabel Lewis, whose stage name was Amy Fellows. <laughs> Darling, she was. 
Isabel, wow. Lu- Isabel Lewis. That's not entirely unattractive. Lewis, no. But but Amy Fellows. Amy Fellows. It's, it's light as a feather now, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so being married, it would seem that the pressures of providing for family while not being automatically successful were a little much. And of course, I may be extrapolating here, but I can't find a lot of other reason for his next few actions within his life and career. (laughs) So being a little disheartened and still pining for the adventurous outdoor life, in 1870, he uprooted with his wife to the Falkland Islands, which is at the very southern tip of South America. Uh As you do. (laughs) You know, as far south as possible. Well, if it doesn't work in London, there's always the Falklands, dear. (laughs) Head south. How far? I don't know. Just go south. Yes. Yes. (laughs) All the way. Just, I I don't, I I could not find rationale for any of this. So it just sounds crazy. I'm sure there was something like, maybe there was some kind of. Yeah. Well, I mean, the Falklands are a U or or a British territory. So I'm like, maybe maybe they were trying to grow colonization there and and get more people down there. But Uh he he, he was an actor. He he (laughs) had started to get known. He seemed to be fitting in. He was married into a family that did some theater and stuff. Uh, Yeah. Um, No, he goes down to the Falklands where he attempted agrarian pursuits in sheep farming. Oh, as one does. Yes. <laughs> well, you know, if this acting thing don't work out, there's always sheep. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God. To be or not to be. Ah! You ruined it. Sheep. You ruined, ruined it. it. That, is, <laughs> that is, is the sheep. Oh. Now, he and his wife welcomed their first child in the Falklands in April 1871, a daughter who they named Eleline. 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 Yeah. Beautiful. However, by the end of 1871, with an infant in tow, the farming life didn't quite seem to pan out right away. Uh-huh. You don't say. <laughs> He'd only tried it for like a year and a half. <laughs> you <Is> know. It... <laughs> the sheep aren't working out. <laughs> the sheep are You mean I got to shear them every year? Yeah. <laughs> They keep dying because they get eaten. <laughs> uh, so, obviously, the the route was to uproot the family again and return to London and try the hand at acting again. Yeah. <laughs> Naturally. I mean, that's, that's, that's the path I went on. Responsible thing to do. <laughs> yes. It's when you Sounds have a brand right. new baby. Yes. <laughs> Drop it all and go back to acting. <laughs> that's a thing i know you really wanted to do this for your whole life but you might have to try to give acting a go again <laughs> it's like someone in a casino being like i know you just lost your life savings but you have a mercedes in the parking lot you've got one more spin on that wheel Al. <laughs> jeez no. By the way, if I get struck by lightning doing this, you'll know why. Oh my God, is it bad? Uh oh, it's okay. glorious outside. Wonderful. Okay, <laughs> this must. I'm doing a ghost story <laughs> on a podcast, and lightning is happening. This is it's a good perfect. point. All right, great. I'm so happy. Now, make fun of it as we might. This mm-hmm. return did see a lot more success for William, as he appeared in several plays at Drury Lane, which is the Royal Theater, including Robin Hood. <gasps> yeah. The original? Okay. Well, one of them. There were there were many, many. I mean, you know, many melodrama. Robin of the Hoods. Absolutely. I mean, it's a great melodrama, you know. Swashbuckling hero is something of a rogue against this evil tyrant of a sheriff. And anyway. perfect. Yep. Made me. <laughs> However, <laughs> still needing to sow his oats for travel, adventure, and commerce. <laughs> <laughs> William again uprooted his family and relocated them to Kentucky to try his hand at horse breeding. Oh my God. Because the <laughs> sheep weren't hard enough. <laughs> wow. Well, you don't, you don't have to shear these and nobody wants to eat them. <laughs> we think. <laughs> <laughs> but this time, 
they had had another child, Tom, who was born in 1872. Similar to his efforts in the Falklands, <laughs> oh, yeah. Williams, Williams' efforts in America proved to be just as fruitful as his efforts down there. Oh, good. And the, and the whole family again returned to London in 1873. After they <laughs> ate all of their horses, because <laughs> You yes. mean we are supposed to ride these? Okay. <laughs> I made country fried steak. <laughs> <laughs> they go great with Amy Fellow's dumplings. Fantastic. The dog food is easy making now. I love how we're turning these, you know, very classy British actors into, you know, white Southern hillbillies. It's great. I mean, it's um, what they eventually became. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> now, it's the second return where William's acting career really started to bloom. He leaned full on his physical qualities that made him perfect for the melodramatic stages at the time. And at the end of the decade, had appeared in several theaters across the West End in heroic swashbuckling roles. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Aha, I am back. By 1880, he gained the nickname Breezy Bill due to the ease with which he could perform as a romantic hero in all their dashing and heroic efforts. Oh, swoon. <laughs> you know, it's like when you watch somebody like do some amazing acrobatic tricks and you're like, they make it look so easy. That's, that's like kind of what Sean Connery back then. <laughs> <A> melod <laughs> melodramatic. <laughs> ah, yep. He just, he, he looked great and sounded great doing it. That's, I love it. He's, I love yeah, it. he's absolutely now Sean Connery. Okay. Throughout the 1880s, William gained more and more credits to his resume, again playing dashing heroic roles, but also dabbled in Shakespearean male leads being seen often in London as Romeo. Nice. <laughs> So, you know, I, I would guess that goes towards his appearance a little bit in that, you know, he's said- He must have looked the, dashing. Yeah. Right, right. You don't look a day over 22. Now, he was also uh, seen as in, in Romeo, but he got the opportunity to uh, tour America in 1883 and 1884 with the Lyceum Theater's tour of Much Ado About Nothing, in which he played- Oh, wow. The, yeah, he played Don Pedro. So, oh. you know, another kind of good guy, but not necessarily the heroic, charismatic hero. Like, you know, I mean, you've got uh, Benedict, who's supposed to be incredibly funny, and Don Pedro is like the military man. So it worked. Yeah. Yeah. Suitable. Mm -hmm. In 1885, while William Starr was rising, he became acquainted with ingenue actor Jesse Millward, who, no. was, Millward, who was 24 at the time, compared mm. to William's... 38. Okay. The pair were cast opposite each other as romantic leads in the play The Harbor Lights, which ran for 513 performances. Wow, that's pretty good back then. It's not a bad way to go. That's a great being, run. Mm -hmm, being seen so frequently on stage together, the two were seen mm -hmm. as the natural romantic pair in melodramas on the London stage and appeared on stage many more times together over the next decade and more, oftentimes wow. at oftentimes at the Adelphi Theater on the Strand in the West End. So it's like Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan. Oh, another another romantic comedy. Again. Okay. okay. <laughs> They've got mail. More mail. I've got so much More mail. More mail. <laughs> <laughs> this also began the suspicion that William and Jesse had begun a romance in real life. Oh. Although it has been difficult to corroborate that. <laughs> <laughs> it's like honestly in my research on it i'm like so what else is said about that nothing i think that people just saw them as romantic on stage and because they had to spend so much time rehearsing and maybe off stage together you know people just went well i assume plus there was only one more thing in this entire story where i heard about his wife and kids wow okay i mean yeah i mean we're, we're yeah but we'll get there <laughs> <laughs> I digress. So William was essentially working contracts for two different theaters over the high point of his career, the Lyceum Theater and the Adelphi Theater, which are both in their original places today as they were back then. Some features have changed, but they're both in the same essential location. And they're really only about a five minute walk from each other. The Lyceum seemed to produce both melodramas and Shakespeare at the time, while the Adelphi seemed to produce primarily melodramas. Okay. William, 
William again toured with the company from the Lyceum in the U.S. twice more, once in 1889 to 90 and once again in 1893 to 94. But this time, he went with Jessie Millward as his leading lady. Oh. oh. <laughs> so, of course, everybody's Tabloid. like, they're together, aren't they? Could be. Mm-hmm. Brangelina Jolie. <laughs> yeah, and when is... Is 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 Beneflex still a, or Jennifer Jennifer Benefer? What the hell is it? Benefer, aren't they back on or something? I this think week? so. I think so. Ju- we don't know. We don't know if it's for another thing or not. She has a lot of. Them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now that she looks twenty four again. Um. <laughs> oh my god, she! I think she took the potion. Yes, she is I, ageless. Yep. Mm-hmm. And you know they mm-hmm. tell you only ten years after that. Yep, no, vanish. No. No, she hasn't. She hasn't, and they haven't taken her out yet. Death becomes her reference for those unfamiliar. Hey, weren't they, didn't they do the musical? Didn't they uh, preview the musical for that with with Kristen Chenoweth? I think they were working on it before the shutdown, and they never finished workshopping it yet. Right, yeah. And I Um, know that they're reshooting uh, a remake of the movie, too, actually. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I I actually have recorded episode number 14 and it's with somebody who lives in New York and she goes to see shows a lot. And uh, oh, nice. we talked a lot about, it, we felt bad for all these shows that were going to get their start. And now you have all these shows that will sell a lot of tickets that are opening up again and saying, hey, yeah. so this is back. That show you really like, it's coming back. But all these shows that were being workshopped, eh, poof. They're on hold because there's no money for them. Right. Yeah, right. it sucks. Bonus. Yeah. So back to uh, William Terrace. No. <laughs> and, and maybe something less depressing. When they returned to London in 1894, William rejoined the Adelphi full time, growing his popularity with the melodramatic audience. He became known as the resident leading man at the Adelphi and was touted as the greatest living actor of his time. My gosh. I know. I know. Just like Chris Hemsworth. Just like Chris Hemsworth. <laughs> Just like the Chris's. Which one? They're all cute. I don't care. They're all anyway. fabulous. <laughs> now, alongside his success on the stage, William had gained quite a bit of interest in the business side of acting and joined the Actors Benefit Fund, which helped okay. out-of-work actors play, pay their living expenses when they couldn't find work. That kind of a cool thing. And eventually, yeah. he, eventually he served on the board of directors there. But... As you recall, this is a ghost story. <laughs> yes, I'm like, where, where is the ghost story? <laughs> It was his work with this group that somewhat indirectly had a hand in his fate. You see, Ooh. William's growing success just made audiences want to see him on stage more and more, which some interpreted as diminishing the availability of leading roles for other up-and-coming actors. Ah. Mm-hmm. One such actor was Richard Arthur Prince, who had understudied for William a number of times and had appeared on stage with him in several productions as well. Prince, however, was not as likable as William. It could be that the only pictures that I saw of him, he had this great dastardly mustache that, you know, <laughs> looked very waxed and, and, you know, very full under the nose and come down and wax into... Automatically looked like the sinister, <laughs> like... <laughs> the guy that walks into a room and you're like, why do you look guilty? <laughs> <laughs> Prince was also known to be prone to angry outbursts at the slightest of provocations and had to be removed from the premises of theaters he'd worked at several times because of, oh, his, wow, okay. because of his violent behavior. Now, I don't think it ever got violent, but it sounded like it could get there. And I think okay. people were just like, uh, before anything happens, you must leave. So his actions gave him a negative nickname, and I can't figure this out, Archer. Or... Archer. Or... Mad Archer or Mad Archie. Mad Archie. <laughs> that is crazy. I mean, I, I think of it like Richard Arthur Prince. Like you get some of those mixed up, you could come up with Archer. Right. 
but other than that, I, I couldn't figure it out. Maybe there was some kind of a connotation for the behavior of archers. I don't know. I don't, I am, I am stumped. <laughs> I can't, I can't think of it. I'm like, rat, rat, rat. Hmm. Nope. <laughs> nope. Nonetheless, whenever people saw him, they, they go, oh my, there's Archer. There's Archer. So in this environment where Prince or Archer, whatever you Archer. prefer, in this environment where he could only find bit parts here and there and could barely make ends meet, he started connecting dots that maybe didn't need to be connected. Ooh. Frankly, he began to see William Terrace as a threat or rather a blockade to his success. Which he was. Yes. But at the same time, it's like (laughs) he was doing what audiences wanted and he was being a decent person. Yeah. He just, in early in his career was- Right, right. Like, oh (laughs) God, I can't believe he's so nice and does what people like. Again? (laughs) Why can't I just be an asshole and get successful? (laughs) Come to America. Right. (laughs) I'll show you a couch we've all heard of. Ooh. Now, the idea that Terrace was actually like trying to block his success was pretty preposterous because William actually consistently seemed to feel pity for this poor archer and was able to acquire him work in some larger roles, just not necessarily the lead roles. Okay. So we helped him out. <laughs> Creeping me out. <laughs> oh, are you getting all kinds of noises? <laughs> yeah there's a thunderstorm <laughs> outside and i heard like the building rattle and i'm like okay we're telling ghost stories <laughs> <laughs> i haven't even gotten to this, the ghost part yet okay. this is perfect <laughs> keep going <laughs> okay so i'll go back just a little bit there so yeah. of course due to prince's behavior and rehearsals he couldn't keep the work and soon yeah. even a star like william terrace couldn't get work for the man man uh, please help help me help a brother out I'm sorry I would, but he just curses too much. I mean, <laughs> it was just kind He's of on that level. a potty mouth. <laughs> <laughs> now, Prince even applied for aid from the Actors Benefit Fund, but was denied. Oh, oh wow, that's mm-hmm, huge. Mm-hmm. And here's where some <laughs> of the unnecessary conspiracy theory comes. Okay. I mean, like I was saying, in his circumstances, I can see how he could have believed this. I mean, on one hand, he actually believed that Terrace personally denied his application, just as his constant presence on the stage at the Adelphi was, quote, denying Prince further opportunity to get cast in lead roles, right? Okay. (laughs) Oh, now remember that play that uh, Jesse Millward and Terrace starred in, uh, uh, you know, several minutes ago <laughs> but yes. it was in, in, in 1885 it was called the harbor lights uh, mm-hmm. went for like 500 some performances yes well prince was in that show with them but oh. prince remembered a time where prince said something offensive in the company of terrace and terrace had him removed and this was oh. during this was during performance oh my gosh <laughs> Like in the middle of the show, he was like, get him yeah. off the stage. <laughs> <laughs> when he gets off the stage, kindly have him stand at the door and kick him in the rump. Thank you. <laughs> Give me that hook. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> now to Prince, to Prince, all of this added up to one conclusion. <laughs> Uh-oh. He had to kill William Terrace. Naturally. <laughs> That'll solve everything. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Well, he's dead now, so I can act. Yes? Hmm. Okay. Yes? All right. On Thursday, December 16th, 1897, William and Jesse were in the middle of the run of a play called The Secret Service and were getting great reviews. Around 7 p.m., William approached the stage door in Maiden Lane at the back of the facility. Or actually, I just found out about this. It's not. The current stage door is at the back of the facility. The actual okay. stage door in those times was on the side of the building. It would be like you're on 45th Street and there's like an alleyway between buildings and that's where you go for your stage door. Got it. Okay. Got it, got it, got it. Yeah, so, like the little, the little whoop. Yeah, yeah. Like maybe a person and a half can walk side by side. I love um, those alleys. Oh, yeah, yeah. So 
he was there with his longtime friend, Harry Graves, with whom he had spent most of the day playing chess and card games. William took the key to the stage door out of his pocket and slouched over to put the key in the door. At that moment, a man rushed out of the shadows. And it looked as though the man had approached William and patted him stoutly twice on the back. Oh, no. What he'd actually done was stabbed him twice with great force. Oh, God. William quickly stood up in pain and turned to face his attacker, Mad oh. Archer Prince. Quote, as Mr. Terrace dropped his glove and turned to face his assailant, Archer plunged the knife into his chest, almost bearing him to the ground with the force of the blow. Holy smokes. <laughs> like anger. Yeah, yeah. After being driven to the ground by Prince's attack, William cried out, My God, I am stabbed! Arrest him! <laughs> It's not funny, but it is. <laughs> My God, I'm stabbed. Arrest him. <laughs> All of that. <laughs> now that, are you sure? He didn't go, ah, shit. Right? Like, what were his words? Hmm. God damn it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Quote, the bystanders who had taken the first two blows as nothing more than hearty slaps on the back as a friend might give. <laughs> then, re then realized what was occurring and rushed forward to restrain Archer before he could strike again. Jesus, this is how naive people were back then. Just like, <laughs> he, was, he had a handle in his, head, in his hand, but he was slapping his back ever so gently. With the handle. Like a friend. With well, a handle. I do that to my friends quite often. Uh, <laughs> Very shiny handle. And then you hear, my God, I am stabbed. Oh, shit, we gotta get... Right? Hurry! <laughs> oh, 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 oh no! He's been stabbed! <laughs> Don't help him, he said, get the constable. <laughs> but apparently, these onlookers were not able to restrain Prince, who had fled. And as okay. soon as William was down, Prince broke through the crowd and tried to avoid suspicion as he disappeared down Maiden Lane, which ran behind the theater. Meanwhile, William was slid into the vestibule just inside the stage door. Jesse Lillyward had already been there, having run from her dressing room when she heard the commotion. Jesse got down on the floor and cradled William's head in her lap. William kept calling out to, around everyone around him to get away, get away, but all <laughs> engaged in assisting him. <laughs> no, don't touch it. Uh, <laughs> I'm dying, help me, get away. <laughs> uh, what do you want? <laughs> Jesse even asked William if he could recognize her and say her name. He mm. showed no signs. Stagehands got pillows to prop him up and got ice for his chest where a wound was bleeding profusely. <clears throat> William laid there in the vestibule of the stage door until medical help could arrive around 7.30 p.m. On examining the patient, there's a quote, on examining the patient, the doctors discovered three stab wounds, one of which situated on the left side of the chest directly above the heart, according to newspaper reports, quote, would have been sufficient enough to cause death, end quote. Wow. The doctors instructed that William be carried to his dressing room where he had a sofa that they could lay him upon. It was reported that he made a few attempts to speak, but nothing really distinguishable, except there was one report where they said his final words may have been, I will be back. <laughs> For his Arnold Schwarzenegger later <laughs> stole <laughs> infringement. That's, listen, that sounds pretty good. I'm going to put that in my movie. I, I will be back. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you this. Those are the greatest words I've ever heard. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> the medical staff pronounced him dead just a few minutes before 8 o'clock when the curtain was wow. to rise. This whole time the audience was taking their seats. Jeez, <laughs> okay. And a Those full curtains house. are heavy. Yep, and the full house had been expected for the evening. An Adelphi Theater representative announced that, quote, Mr. Terrace had met with a, such a serious accident that he would be totally unable to appear that night, end quote. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. The end. Just put these in the playbill. Hurry. <laughs> What's wrong? There's a hole in him. Three of them. <laughs> One's bleeding rather profusely. 
<laughs> right by his heart. I can hear it. The, the other two we don't know. He's laying on his back. <laughs> All audience members were then eligible for a full refund or an exchange ticket for another night. <laughs> ah, good. A rain check at least. <laughs> good. Oh, well, I hate it when actors die the moment they're supposed it's, to go on stage. Can, can people <laughs> wait to be stabbed for two uh, hours? Oh, but I suppose the show must not go on, as they say. Absolutely. I'm not getting my revenue again, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Every time we come to the theater, an actor dies, and we have to go see something terrible. That's oh, God. it. I told you, Lawrence, the old blows <laughs> from now on. They only die <laughs> on stage, and it's only sometimes. And that's okay with me. <laughs> Now, meanwhile, in the street behind the theater, William's friend Henry Graves, who accompanied him to the theater and was there when he was stabbed, he had followed Prince and eventually caught up to him. Okay. He found a constable with the bad guy in tow, and the constable and Graves brought Prince to a police station where Graves charged him with the murder of William Terrace. Prince was taken into custody, and throughout his time in custody, and through the murder trial, he stated coolly and calmly, that he had done his duty and that the act was an act of revenge and that he had intended to kill Jesse Millward as well. Wow. <laughs> Just, did you do it? Wow. Yep. yep. Did, did you mean to? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> Where's Passion my fish sandwich? crime. <laughs> Where's my fish sandwich? But through the trial, due to his lack of remorse, along with his well-known history of violence, Prince obviously was noted as suffering from some serious mental illness. I mean, honestly, like I, I, this seemed to be much of a more of a deeper rooted problem than before he met William Terrace. You know, it's kind of like John Hinckley thinking that Jodie Foster was talking directly to him. <laughs> right. You know, something was going on before he watched uh, Taxi Driver. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, because it seemed as though Prince felt that justice had been served by his actions, that he was truly mentally gone. Here's a quote. In giving their verdict, the jury found Prince guilty of the murder, adding that they found the prisoner knew what he was doing and to whom he was doing it, but that upon the medical evidence, he was insane so as not to be responsible for his actions according to law at the time he committed the act. Okay. Oh, you didn't mean wow. to. You meant to, but you didn't mean, you didn't know you meant to. Okay. Therefore, mm -hmm. pardon. Continuing on, he was duly sentenced to be, quote, Detained until her Detained. majesty's until her majesty's pleasure be known. <laughs> oh God! Like, like as she's getting up and eating her breakfast every morning. Well, we've got the usual list of prisoners. Do you want to release any of them? Oh no! <laughs> no, absolutely not. <laughs> when will your pleasure be known? Ugh! Ask again tomorrow, <laughs> Barnaby. <laughs> He was sent to Broadmoor Criminal Lunatic Asylum, where he became involved in entertainment for the inmates and conducted oh the prison my orchestra. Gosh. <laughs> and wow. conducted the prison orchestra until his death in 1936. Whoa. <laughs> he was in there for 29 years. Oh my God. <laughs> Conducting, <laughs> that that's that is that that's crazy. Wow, Isn't that nuts. Um, I guess there was another actor at the time, Henry Irving, who was quoted as saying something like this, and I'm paraphrasing. It's like, well, because he was an actor, obviously the sentence was commuted. Ah, <laughs> oh, I am dead. I want that. Where's that movie script? Yeah, right, right. Yes. William Terrace was buried in Brompton Cemetery in London, and his service was attended by 10,000 people. Wow. William actually has a second marker in the cemetery, which will allow for better pedestrian traffic flow. <laughs> 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 I can't see me grand. There's too many people looking at William. <laughs> now, here we go. All right. Some strange things occurred in the days before the attack. Quote, 
The day before the murder of William Terrace, his understudy, Frederick Lane, had come to the theater in an agitated state and related to all who would listen the details of a vivid and distressing dream he had had the night before. Ooh. He recounted that he had dreamed that William Terrace, surrounded by actors and stagehands, was lying unconscious on the stairs leading to the theater's dressing rooms. His chest was bare and blood was streaming from a gaping wound. Oh. An exact portent of what would occur the following night. Whoa. Three witnesses later signed affidavits that Lane had related his story to them before, before the murder occurred. Holy smoke. <laughs> you have been chosen. No. No, I haven't. I mean, and, and you know, like you'd have to think William would have heard that. Right. And, and I don't know, like, you know, when you hear stories like this and you look back at them, you go, wouldn't you have just not shown up the next night? <laughs> you have an understudy who saw you dead in his dream. Take, take the, night. the night off. Let the understudy <laughs> take the, the knife, bro. <laughs> That Maybe would be give him great. your hat and coat. <laughs> <laughs> and wear this exactly and speak and sound just like me. And I need you to turn around and shut the door just like this so you get stabbed in the back twice. Never mind. I'm... Forget that last sentence. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> I mean. Uh... Now, in, a, in addition, William had relayed to several of his friends that on a lark, he had visited a fortune teller the week before at the Green Room Club. Quote, what do you think? I've just had my fortune told and the woman says that I will die a violent death. End quote. Now, <laughs> I've never been to a fortune teller. Never been to a fortune teller. It's my understanding they have something of a reputation for the dramatic. Yes. <laughs> What's going to happen to you? You'll probably lick a stamp tomorrow, put it on an envelope, and no, no, it's not. It's never that. It's what's no. going to happen to me? Ooh, death and destruction. <laughs> it's also said that his wife Isabel's fox terrier was laying on her lap at home and started barking, growling, and snapping without warning at the very moment that William died. Oh, <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, and they say, like, dogs might be able to sense that kind of thing, right? Mm-hmm. And that was the last that anyone had seen of William Terrace until 1928. Wow. And here is the report. Quote, the first reported sighting in the Adelphi Theater was made in 1928. A young actress known only as June. <laughs> we don't know anything. Okay. June. June. <laughs> Just June. Thank you. June was sleeping before a performance in her dressing room when the chaise lounge underneath her began to shake. She investigated and found nothing. When it began again, she saw a greenish mist. Then something grabbed her arms and held her to the chaise. Then there came two knocks at the door, which ended the ordeal. Oh. When she asked about her room later, she found it belonged to William Terrace. And during his life, when he walked to the room, he would knock on the door with his cane to see if anybody was in the room. Holy shit, that's crazy. <laughs> right? <laughs> Getting freaked out there? <laughs> yeah, that's intense. Yep. June's arms were bruised for several days after the event. <laughs> Ooh. From being held down by a green mist ghost. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. And it was said that there were stagehands outside who could hear her kind of thrashing around and did see a little bit of the green glow under the door. Oh, that's creepy too. Right? Between 1928 and 1950, William appeared as a green mist, which would appear suddenly and frighten spectators, not maliciously, just out of the blue, or slowly hover from one side of the stage to the other where it would disappear. Or he would be seen at the stage door, still somewhat greenish, but more like a human emerging from a mist, like the ghost, a ghost we might see in the movies. Right? Okay. But how did he come to be seen in the Covent Garden tube station in 1955? 
if you've ever been to the West End, you know that the Adelphi and the Lyceum are a short walk from the Covent Garden tube station, no more than a five to 10 minute walk from either location. But the tube station had nothing to do with the murder. In fact, it was nowhere near being constructed at the time of the murder. So what could the connection be? Is it possible that William was adding more to the mystery? Perhaps there was even more of this story that needed to be told? Actually, according to the records, in the street above the tube station, where the tube station currently is, there was a bakery. One that used to see frequent patronage from William Terrace. And one where he would often get a delightful pastry before heading to the theater to appear on stage. <laughs> delightful. Wow. <laughs> the last time anyone saw William's ghost was in the tube station in 1972. On Maiden Lane, directly above the Adelphi Theater, there's a circular green plaque on the wall outside the stage, where the stage door currently is. The inscription reads, William Terrace, 1847 to 1897, hero of the Adelphi melodramas, met his untimely end outside this theater, 16th December, 1897. And of course, like I said, this is a bit out of place because when William Terrace was killed, the stage door was on the side of the building, not directly facing Maiden Lane. Okay. And his ghost was never seen where the current stage door is, but rather walking through the wall where the stage door was when he died. Wow. <laughs> That's really cool. The knife that was used to kill William Terrace was on display at 2015 at the Crime Museum exhibition in the Museum of London. The knife is still stained with William's blood. Whoa, they kept it red. And that's the story of William Terrace's ghost. <laughs> that is crazy haunting. Whoa. I mean, I love, there's that old adage that if your theater doesn't have a ghost, invent one. <laughs> yes. But at the same time, it's like, there is, I, like, you know, you've heard about haunted churches or temples or synagogues or stuff like that, because it's a place where souls come to explore themselves, right? Of course. I just love the idea that there are so many ghost sightings at theater, you know. Right? It's, it's not like there's another wave of ghost sightings at public accountants' offices. <laughs> <laughs> at the dentist office this day, or <laughs> yesterday, you wouldn't believe what I saw. Every McDonald's in Birmingham, Alabama had the McFlurry machines turn on at the same time. <laughs> and poor a <or> small. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I just love the fact that, yeah, you can probably just anticipate that there might be a ghost. Like, I don't, somebody asked me when I was getting ready for this episode, do you believe in ghosts? I went, yeah, yeah I guess. <laughs> well. <laughs> I don't have a reason not to, and I don't have a reason to believe in ghosts. Right. I mean, I've seen strange things happen and strange things that I can't explain. Like my story I told at the beginning about Henry and the light turning off next to me. Well, they were having really bad problems with electricals right then. And uh, throughout the rest of the season, when I was getting lights done, like circuits would turn off and everything. We just needed a new circuit breaker. <laughs> but, oh, wow. but, but <laughs> that could be the manifestation of the paranormal. It's like, how does it happen? Well, we have to actually make it happen through science, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> it has to make sense <laughs> so i don't know i don't know i think it's fascinating i love that ghosts love are it. so into theater that'd be kind of fun to do like a, a tour of a few big theaters in the nation and like do a ghost tour oh yeah yeah um and, and like i said uh I, I i wrote to some friends in london and i asked him about william terrace and if they had heard about him and and a couple of them were like, oh, yeah, that's a very famous ghost story. But I tell you what, if you're going to tell a ghost story, talk about Drury Lane. I guess they have like this whole cast of ghosts that show up at Drury Lane. <laughs> Damn, we're going to have to talk more about that than another time. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yep. Yep. I mean, but uh, I, I love like 
you know, you hear about these ghost stories. And yes, William Terrace died in a very violent way. He got stabbed in the back twice, stabbed in the chest once, and died within 30 minutes. But there wasn't anything else going on in his story. <laughs> like, he was a, a, a very famous actor, and a guy just kind of went crazy, you know? It wasn't like he was stealing from someone. Or, I mean, there was a suggestion that he was having this affair. N- nope. He's just a dude. Just wild <laughs> jealousy. Yep, yep. Just one guy. Random went, happenstance. That's it. Yep. Well, that's there so we go. That's wild, dude. That's wow. a story of William Terrace. Story time. That was that was <laughs> awesome. I really hope that I find you well again after this, because I know a thunderstorm just went through as we were talking about a ghost yeah, story. Yeah, <laughs> that was something else. I'm like, jeez. <laughs> of course. Well, there we go. That's our story for today, William Terrace. Fantastic. Thanks again for coming on, James. I'm glad you did. And hey, all of you listeners out there, you want an amazing cut and color while sipping a martini or two, uh, go ahead. And if you're in the Casper, Wyoming area, go find James at the Hair Bar. Yeah? yeah. That sounds good to me. Come and right. see me. We'll talk theater. We'll have a little buzz going and get you colored all beautiful. Beautiful. And for beautiful. my listeners... I am Aaron Odom from Trident Theater in Sheridan, Wyoming. And until next time, I will see you at intermission.